Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today, as frequent viewers well know, has joined me here time and again over the last quarter century and more. To be sure, we still don't agree on some important priorities, though I know that increasingly I hesitate more about rejecting his seeming eternal verities than he does mine. And that's probably because I wonder ever more and more whether my friend Floyd Abrams America's preeminent First Amendment attorney could possibly mean increasingly these days to summon up free speech First Amendment arguments in defense of corporations as well as individuals, in defense of Standard & Poor's questionable credit ratings that many believe did so much to take America on the road to financial collapse, in defense of giant corporate contributors too and manipulators of American political campaigns, in defense of big tobaccos, addiction and death-dealing merchandising techniques, unless he simply knows something I don't. We both know, of course, that money talks, but my question to Floyd Abrams remains, must it enjoy seemingly unlimited free speech? Could that possibly be what the founders meant when they proclaimed that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Or what the very preamble to the Constitution meant in pledging the people of the United States to promote the general welfare. Indeed, I would first ask Floyd Abrams whether he appreciates the real unease many of his former free speech comrades in arms feel at his use now of the First Amendment to defend corporate interests as if they were the equivalent of individual Americans' right to speak freely. As the New York Times editorialized just the day before we taped this program, the founders of this nation knew just what they were doing when they drew a line between legally created economic entities and living, breathing human beings. That's really putting it to you, isn't it, Floyd? Not really. Uh, that's what they think. They they sometimes forget that they're a corporation, but but uh, that's that's what that they the think. the Times is a corporation. Yes, yes. But you didn't. We have lots of corporations that I have represented through the years of which you have approved. You happen to disapprove, or think that it is unworthy to give First Amendment protection to uh, other sorts of corporations. Take the case now in front of the Supreme Court. I don't understand how my friends with whom. I have generally agreed through the years, could possibly think, possibly think, that uh -oh, it was I appropriate it to criminalize, criminalize, well, that's what's happened. A movie about Hillary Clinton made uh, and ready for distribution during the political campaign in which she was seeking the presidency, uh, and because of federal election campaign laws, on the face of it, that movie, if shown on television at least, would uh, in all likelihood uh, be a crime. Now, I don't understand what's hard about that case. I understand the discomfort people feel about uh, certain types of corporate speech, which I'm glad to talk about. But as a starting point, the case now before the Supreme Court is one which does seem to me 
ought to command the support, the First Amendment side, of all the normal, usual allies of the First Amendment. But they don't. Uh, and I think that's, that's a very sad, sad uh, recent development. Why don't they, Floyd? Because the cause of reform, or regulation, if you will, but however you put it, um, has commanded so much support uh, within, I don't even want to say just the liberal community, but the intelligentsia community, the opinion makers. Limousine liberals. No, no, people, people I like to hang out with uh, uh, intellectually um, uh, because they care so much about trying to make the political system better as they see it that they refuse even to acknowledge that there's a very major loss of speech involved uh, in their activities if they prevail. I mean, uh, again, th this case isn't a made-up case. Uh, this, is, this is the real case on, on the face of a federal statute in effect and honored and supported by all the, my usual, or my old friends anyway, um, it's a crime uh, to put a movie on television partially funded, indeed funded almost at all, by a union or a corporation if it endorses, supports, or opposes the election of somebody within certain time limits. How can that be? Election speech? Of all the speech in the world, one would think, speech about elections, about who to vote for, or uh, this right-wing group that put this movie together, uh, who you should uh, hate or who you should never want as president. What, what could be more at the absolute core of the First Amendment than that? Floyd, let me ask you, as the cleverest lawyer I know, uh -oh. what language would you use to combat that Abrams question of, would you criminalize a film, producing right. a film or distributing a film about Hillary Clinton. Is there something short of criminalizing that would enable the government, would enable our legislators to prevent something from happening that they think, that they think goes against the public right. interest? Well, in that area, I would say no. Uh, I would say that, uh, I mean, there are competing interests for, for sure, but speech about elections, speech about uh, t take the film uh, as the filmmakers d argue it's not, but take the film as direct advocacy to oppose Hillary Clinton's then quest for the presidency. No, I don't think there's anything the government should have the power to do to prevent that film from being shown. Is there something less than criminalizing? Anything, a fine. Uh, uh, I mean, in the, in the area of libel law, for example, it, it's not, we, we don't criminalize libel law in America. Uh, nonetheless, even though the penalty is civil, it's, it's, it's a state-imposed penalty, a libel judgment. And because of that, uh, the Supreme Court in 1964 said there was a very strong First Amendment interest which had to be accommodated. What other interests are there that concern you? There's First Amendment, there's good food, good medical uh, care, et cetera. What other interests? Yeah, there must be. There are national security interests, there are privacy interests, uh, there are uh, uh, interests uh, uh, which are, I would call, primarily moral. The Supreme Court's about to hear an argument uh, in a case in which the question is, is a federal statute that bans the showing of movies sh uh, and other depictions of cruelty to animals mm -hmm. constitutional? Um, and uh, there's no doubt that all 50 states have passed laws designed to protect animals against cruelty. Uh, that interest has to be weighed in some way uh, against uh, a quite strong First Amendment argument, which, which prevailed in the lower court. Uh, so th there are always competing interests, but the fact that there are always competing interests 
is one of the things that leads me to say we have to start out with the notion that it, it better be a very, very strong competing interest which can trump the uh, level of First Amendment protection and, and the intensity of the, the, the need of, of free speech in and particular you, areas. So, you, you, so wouldn't, for example, you wouldn't so describe our concern about the electoral process as overwhelming. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it overwhelms. I don't think it should overwhelm the right to free speech about who to vote for. No, I don't. Free speech about? Free speech about who speech to vote for. about campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, there are other areas. We give a lot less protection to commercial speech. I think that's appropriate. Uh, commercial speech being essentially buy-sell, sort of, advertising, sort of, speech. Um, and uh, so, in that sort of case, a very different sort of balance is struck. The First Amendment wins sometimes, uh, but it loses sometimes. And I don't think that the societal interest in allowing commercial speech, while real, uh, uh, approaches that of, of the uh, First Amendment interest in allowing electoral speech. Well, now, our, our which side of the table is Floyd Abrams sitting on here? I thought you were particularly concerned about uh, the speech, the First Amendment rights of Standard & Poor's. Well, Standard & Poor's speech is not what the courts deem commercial speech. St Standard & Poor's speech is opinions about creditworthiness. That, that sort of speech, uh, similar and for similar reasons, to speech uh, what, recommending a purchase of a stock uh, uh, is not generally deemed uh, commercial speech. A description of commerce is no less protected by the First Amendment because it's commerce uh, than a depiction of uh, climate control issues. You think that this is what the founders meant by that uh, noble First Amendment? I don't know if the, you know, if the framers had in mind, in fact, we have every reason to think they didn't have in mind with any specificity uh, what, what was covered. I think they meant to cover opinions, yeah. I think they meant to protect opinions um, about... Uh, Corporate opinions? Yeah, I, I don't think they would have cared whether it was a corporation or an individual. As, as I said at the start, we have a lot of corporations uh, that have uh, contributed and many that have not contributed to the public wheel. Uh, and corporations that speak out editorially or otherwise, not, not just media, but corporations that have something to say, uh, a position to take. I think should be fully protected. Uh, you say editorially or otherwise, you're coming back to the point that the Times, the New York Times, is a corporation. And uh, you... Well, yeah, not, not just the Times. I'm, 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 I'm saying that we will never live in a country, I think, uh, in which the courts, at least, distinguish between the basic rights of one sort of corporation uh, and another. They may distinguish based on the nature of the speech, but not the nature of the corporation. Uh, and um, it seems to me that, uh, well, take in New York Times against Sullivan, you had not just the New York Times corporation, you had individuals uh, who were there too, who were also defendants. Right. They all won the case. They all got the same protection. Uh, and they all, of course, should have gotten the same protection. I don't think the, the form of the entity matters, uh, whether it's a corporation uh, or an individual uh, or a partnership or what, whatever else you, you want to conjure up. Uh, we have some different sorts of speech. As I say, we, have, we attach some different level of legal protection to different levels uh, of speech, but uh, 
uh, I don't think the distinction ought to be made, and I don't think it will be made, and it hasn't been made, uh, but between speech of corporations as such uh, and, and speech of non-corporations. So we, we reach a point where I, I was serious before when I've said to you, and I've said this to you away from this table, I find myself not being more and more moved by your arguments, more and more concerned, however, about them, more and more concerned about the very basic role in a good society of opinion, of free speech, call it what you will. But then I'm overwhelmed, Floyd, as so many of your friends are, other than myself, by our social needs, by other needs in our society. You mentioned privacy yourself before as a competing interest, but I mean needs, wants, desires in the public sphere, regulation of um, political campaigns so that they, ex they, they reflect more what the founders <coughs> really meant them to reflect, and many other things. Are you not concerned about uh, the use of the First Amendment? No, I'm not concerned about the use of the First Amendment. I, uh, I thought you were asking me, and I accept the notion, that there is a significant social interest, genuine, non-feigned social interest in having an electoral system that works and a political system that uh, represents the public. Uh, but for me, uh, I consider it uh, alien uh, to our history and our nature as a free people to say that in the service of that, what would otherwise be considered core free speech and free expression uh, can be suppressed, punished, limited uh, in the way that uh, some of our current laws do. But I remember once uh, our, uh, having a discussion always about this issue fundamentally, uh, in which I made some reference to, um, was it Brandeis' um, uh, use of the word reasonable in a free speech uh, setting, and you stopped me and said, that's the trouble. Uh, you picked out that one word. Uh, how can we address fundamental problems in our society? How would you put your own well-informed uh, body of knowledge, your, your, your thinking to these social questions that do seem to come back to the need for regulations? Well, uh, let, let's stay for a moment with the electoral system. Yes. There are two things that come to mind. One is a disclosure, a lot of it. Uh, I think that, uh, and, and some First Amendment types disagree, but I think uh, that uh, uh, it is constitutional to have uh, uh, a system which, as part of it, requires, uh, except in very extraordinary cases, the disclosure to the public of uh, not only who's contributing money, but, but who's spending it. Uh, uh, that's part of it, uh, and I think that that's, that's important. I think uh, public funding uh, of elections, uh, an unrealistic hope right now, certainly on a national level, but public funding uh, is something that, uh, if I had my way, uh, we'd have a lot more of. We, we have a good deal of it here in New York City. Uh, uh, a lot of states have it. That doesn't keep Mike Bloomberg was from spending $75, 80000000 million uh, on a campaign uh, and blitzing the television networks uh, with one advertisement after another, but it at least provides some way for uh, his opponents uh, to get out a message and, and to try to get in front of the public. Uh, I think that's uh, an important element. Um, also, uh, I think, as we saw in the Obama campaign uh, uh, last a few years ago, that the very fact that a uh, charismatic uh, uh, 
appealing candidate on issues as well as personally was able to raise so much money from the public uh, uh, from, uh, to an extraordinary d degree is a, a sign of the public's willingness to become involved in uh, political affairs. Um, and, and I think that that, that sort of uh, uh, involvement which, where, uh, I mean, what can the public do? Well, the public can get involved on street corners by helping out in a campaign. They can also get involved by contributing if they have money uh, or spending it if they have money. And, and I, I don't think, not on a cynical basis, I don't think you can just even posit a system in which communicating with hundreds uh, of millions of people uh, can occur uh, without rather vast sums of money being spent in political campaigns. I mean, I think that, that to, to think of it that way, as some of my friends do, is uh, beyond naivete. It has nothing to do with the world in which we live. One cannot communicate anymore. Maybe that's sad reality, but, it, but it's, it's reality. One cannot communicate w without significant sums of money uh, uh, going into the communicative process. Because communications is the key. Well, in, back in 1968, when the 20th Century Fund, now the 21st Century uh, Fund, uh, asked Newt Minow to chair a commission on money, television, and politics. And I managed that uh, for him. Uh, we came up a, with a report based on the notion of public funding. But of course, they could only be the use of public funding. And that funding went for the very communications that you are addressing right now. Would you accept that? That the public funds campaigns but those are the only campaign. That's the only that's campaign the only that no. can take no, place. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, I would say the public funding is a, an additional, uh, an alternative route, uh, but not a substitute. You've said to me when we talked about <coughs> media violence and some limitations, some regulation. You said you you considered it not that significant, that too much had been made about uh, the impact, nothing had been proven or demonstrated about the impact of media violence on our children, etc. Do you feel strongly enough about the use and misuse of big money in political campaigns to, to go work. another step, to make that step? You seem to say no. Uh, no. Uh, Is there anything that you would be on crying fire in a crowded oh, sure, theater? Sure, sure. Like mean, we, we limit. First, we have whole categories of speech, which we, we, it sounds like game playing, uh, verbal game playing, which we define as not speech. Uh, uh, we say, for example, that espionage, uh, uh, that perjury, which are speech crimes, Mm -hmm. uh, well, we treat that as not speech. All right, we, we have to find a way. Uh, and historically, uh, uh, perjury has always been a crime. It should be. Um, uh, the fact that it's words doesn't in and of itself mean that it's therefore uh, within the realm of the First Amendment. I mean, the First Amendment has some historical moorings uh, and, and we look to see as one of the elements of our analysis, you know, what it's meant in the past and if this is the sort of speech that, that we're talking about. Um, and people can disagree on things like that, uh, uh, and they do. Um, then we get into the speech, the, the real speech areas, and yes, there are competing interests and where the courts have gone is to say, well, uh, nothing's absolute. Uh, we look to see if there's a compelling interest uh, in uh, some other social 
uh, a cause or interest, and if a statute is drafted so narrowly that it addresses just that uh, interest and no more. Uh, I think that is a, a diminishment which goes uh, uh, too far uh, uh, as against uh, speech because I think there are lots of compelling interests uh, and, and uh, it, it doesn't uh, satisfy my sense of where the law ought to be. So you to don't want in the present case, you've just argued for there to be a narrow decision about the Clinton film. No, I've argued that there should be a broad decision. Yes, I'm saying. In order to protect the First Amendment broadly, uh, be because in my view, uh, what is illustrated by that case, but only illustrated, uh, is, a, is a, a serious speech deprivation problem. Um, and the problem is that uh, uh, corporate and union funds are being banned across the board uh, in the area in which, in my view, there is least room uh, for the Congress and a self-interested Congress at that, but for the Congress to say, you can't say that. So uh, in that sort of area, I'm, I am least open to saying, uh, well, we can limit speech here or, or uh, shape it. So, you know, uh, for example, uh, 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 opponents of the position that, that I take on this say, well, corporations can use political action committees, PACs, uh, rather than uh, use their own funds. So the corporate leaders, so to speak, can give money, but the corporation can't. Uh, for me, that's uh, insufficient. Uh, 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 and I think that uh, uh, in terms of uh, core central free speech principle that, that when you're in the election area, most of all, uh, we have to be most careful. I'm being told to say goodbye, and I don't mind saying goodbye if you promise that we can continue this another time. Absolutely. Thank Floyd you. Floyd Abrams, thanks for joining me again today, even though I still think you're wrong. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at theopenmind.tv. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Blue Stein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.